Thank you for joining the Judaism Demystified podcast. Rabbi Sachs, what was your personal journey to Rambam? Um, well, I, I would say I've had a pretty um, classic education growing up. Uh, modern Orthodox, um, grade school, high school, spent a couple of years in Israel, spent quite a few years in a, in a yeshiva, mainly in a, in a brisker uh, environment, uh, uh, and um, tremendous uh, experience, tremendous ideas. And I guess um, uh, I came into uh, education, I came out of yeshiva, went into education, and um, I, I, and in later life, I found out this is by no means an uncommon uh, situation. I came in all revved up uh, to give over as I'd given up, been given in uh, in yeshiva. And uh, the experience of uh, of teaching was a real eye opener. And uh, I um, I discovered that uh, there were a lot of gaps in in my education, and uh, and those gaps. Um, pointed to something which uh, which really I had not uh, I had heard of I had thought of I had read but I'd never really thought through the implications to their ultimate uh, conclusion and that is that I, I found that uh, the um, teaching that I had been taught though I had many wonderful ideas earth-shattering ideas which I very much enjoyed was not something that I was able to uh, give over to uh, tell me them always. And uh, that was because uh, it was just too difficult. Be it the, uh, the, the, the learning in, in, in Judaism is based on, uh, on Talmud. And the Talmud is a wonderful, uh, wonderful piece, but uh, it's extremely difficult. The language is difficult. The logic is difficult. And uh, I found that uh, Though certain Talmudim were able to thrive in this uh, environment, many were not, and uh, and I, I was uh, I would say the vast majority were not, and uh, that uh, really was an eye opener for me. How could that be that uh, something which uh, which had seemed so uh, always been the center of my life was not working as a, as a tool for giving the sower to the next generation to so many children? What does this mean? And slowly, slowly, words of the Rambam uh, came to me and a new significance. And really, this is something that the Rambam had spoken about uh, many, many years ago, that uh, he really, why he wrote his Mishnah Torah was that uh, he says it in his Akdama to his, uh, to his work, his introduction to his Mishnah Torah, that the t exactly what I found in my own experience, that uh, the Talmud, as wonderful as a, as a work as it is, is especially in our day, in his day, he was talking about his day, and it got, it's not gotten any better, had to become too difficult for as a tool of teaching over Misorah to the uh, to the people. And uh, something had to be changed, and that was his Mishneh Torah. And that uh, really is my journey to the Rambam, that uh, awakening to those words, which uh, I had always known, but uh, I tried the giving over Misorah through Talmud, and I, the Rambam said that's not going to work, and uh, I found in my experience that uh, he was right so many years ago. And what specifically did you find that was difficult about it? Like, what is it that your students weren't able to grasp? Well, the uh, what the what the Rambam mentions, and uh, is that, and I found that in my own experience as well. It's so many different layers. It's uh, the language. It's in an old Aramaic that uh, people don't speak. They didn't speak in those days, in the days of the Rambam, and uh, they certainly don't speak it today. The the uh, the argumentation, which can be very very lengthy, the uh, the need to put together a tremendous amount of sources. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, I was just looking, for example, at the very first halacha. In uh, we're just coming out of Hanukkah now. The very first ha halacha of, of 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 the Rambam on Hanukkah, and uh, it talks about the history of Hanukkah. And I was trying to count how many sources would it take uh, to uh, to be able to know that first halacha in the Rambam, and it was over twelve, just to know that first halacha in the Rambam, so, ranging from Masechet Shabbos to uh, 
to uh, to uh, me, me dose to uh, to many uh, chuvas of the Gaonim, and that's just to get one halacha on the Rambam. So uh, the combination of the uh, of the difficult language, the need to go through so many different sources, the argumentation. Of course, the argumentation builds upon itself because there could be machlokis about in the Gemara. There could be machlokis about that machlokis among the Rishonim. There can be a machlokas about the machlokas of Rishonim and the in the Acharonim. And while certain outstanding students would love that, or even very good students, many, many students weren't able to follow. And even if they weren't able to fo- were able to follow, to get from that a comprehensive understanding of halakha is simply uh, beyond the capacity of the ordinary person. Hmm. Yeah, it's almost like counterintuitive. Like you're you're trying to get to the law and then you're taking down this rabbit hole that, you know, leads you sometimes to more confusion. To more confusion. And how is one going to get from that? A, a, the, the, the bar that the Torah sets for us is very, very high. Uh, I like very much the slogan of the, of the latest Rambam. It's called Mifal Mishneh Torah. It's called Kol HaTorah LeKol Echad. The whole Torah for everyone. When, when we were given the mitzvot at Sinai, we were not given uh, uh, one mitzvah, we were not given a few halachot, we are not even given the four halakim of the Shulchan Aruch. We were given 613 mitzvot. So if we are going to get stuck on a, on a detail of one halacha going down this rabbit hole, we could spend our entire lifetime and maybe understand a few halachot. How are we going to get to understanding of a, of a life emerging from 613 mitzvot? That also naturally leads to, like, you know, the idea of kolel and, you know, learning full time and, you know, not working. Because if a person wants to know kola Torah kula, as you mentioned, how difficult it is to navigate through the Talmud, it seems like a, like a, like a natural progression uh, to eventually, you know, you know, you have to devote literally every second of your life in just even, you know, just to do Bav Metziah properly. You could spend years. Right years right it's, it's it's you know it's hard to understand how i guess what i'm trying to say is it, it's hard to understand for the common person how the torah is applicable to everybody kola torah kula that slogan that you're saying that we should we all should know kola torah kula it, it seems the way it's the way it's brought the way it's taught in the yeshivas it's like a never-ending you know it doesn't ever end so there's no there's no there's no it never solidifies into anything so that's right that's yep. right. Is that your experience as well? Yep, hundred percent. Yes, mm-hmm. and uh, the um, there's many many consequences to this. The, the, oftentimes, the consequence of this when it doesn't trace them back to their true root cause. The the, uh, the Rambam uh, points out that it's not just that there's an arbitrary six hundred thirteen mitzvot. Uh, the six hundred thirteen mitzvot come together to fit together into a systemic whole. So if a person only has a few fragmented uh, halachot that he learns, and with many, many, many machlokot about that, he'll lose the forest for the trees. Now, the consequence of that is that uh, people realize and see that things are not working, so they try to bring all sorts of uh, externals in. Since the Torah is not giving rich meaning and, and, and depth of understanding and insight of how to live life well, and people are getting disinterested. So um, people bring in alien things. Uh, some people, it's, it's singing. Some people, it's, uh, it's meditating. Some people, it's dancing. Some people, it's uh, mystical philosophies. All of these things are coming from the same thing, namely an, a, a lack in our education at the most fundamental level to give over an understanding of the 613 mitzvot, which really show people how to live a life which is good and meaningful and rich and uh, and good. Absolutely. So we don't get the real thing. We start grasping at straws. And again, I'm not saying there's something wrong with singing. Gesundheit, uh, right. sing. Uh, people want to dance, dance. But if it's a substitute, if it's a Band-Aid to cover up for the fact that the Torah is not the, being the center of our Jewish experience, if it's not giving us a good life and an exciting life and a meaningful life, then I have a problem with that. I, I would say also that one of the things which I noticed when I was in yeshiva back in the day that really bothers me, bothered me and still bothers me is 
kind of we just jump into the Gemara, we jump into the Machlokets, we jump into everything, but there's no context. There's no premise to begin with. What is a Machloket? How, we under- how do we understand the Machloket? Never even explained. It's just, we just dive in, jump in, and yeah. it's kind of like, just like an overload of information, and, and especially when we're in our teenage years, that how, how do we process that? You know what I mean? And a lot of people will just go to Elo Velo Divokim Chaim and end it there and not really have a true understanding of what, what a machloket really is in the Gemara. These very uh, basic foundational points are not even given any attention, which is a problem, in my opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think also that we we start off, you know, on a, with a very low level understanding of, let's say, Tanakh, which is the foundation of it all. Like, uh, you know, understanding Mikra and also have being being able to understand or differentiate between what is what is the midrash saying what is it teaching us trying to understand what is actually torah what is the midrash so then that's a big that's a big source of confusion because as you grow older you just jump from that to mishnayot and then from mishnayot which a lot of them are not like halakha ma'aseh and then you end up going to gemara and there's no mention of god or philosophy or understanding what it is what is this that we're dedicating our lives to uh, which is, you know, Hashem, uh, we don't even have the faintest understanding of, of who we're serving, yeah. you know? And and that to me is just, it's something that I think irks a lot of people when they're, when they're if they don't click with Gemara, if they don't have, a, they're not legally, um, um, you know, gifted. oriented, yeah, gifted, then, then they're, everybody just gives up. The fundamentals right. are just, are just glossed over. It's, yeah. it's a problem. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, and especially, like the Rambam says, uh, in our day, this has become very, very difficult. And I would say that in our day, it's become much, much worse. I was reading a pamphlet uh, by uh, Ravar Lichtenstein. Interestingly enough, he talks about this problem also. He's got a whole pamphlet about it. And um, and he says, insofar as this, uh, this problem, that... Um, that the student is also comparing his study of uh, of Torah to all the other subjects he's studying. So if he, let's say he's studying, uh, uh, I don't know, science, he's studying uh, math, he's studying history. All of these have very well organized textbooks. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a there's a careful development of a of a topic. There's a there's an introduction that shows how all the different topics fit together into a whole. There there's a sequence to the topics. And then he comes to his uh, Jewish studies, and uh, it, it it's 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 stark. There seems to be no beginning, no end. There's no sequence of topics, yeah. and uh, it's not like uh, in the old days where there was no comparison. There's a there's a there's a sharp sharp comparison, and uh, the Torah doesn't get its proper due because of that. And uh, and that is really where. Uh, the Rambam can come in and uh, really make a tremendous difference because everything which the student will be expecting is right there. The yeah. it starts with the Yisodei Torah, it introduces the most fundamental ideas of the Torah, and introduces where all the mitzvot are going to be, what the purpose is of the mitzvot that they're going to be coming next. There's a sequence of the books; each one has its own topic that it's explaining. Each of that is subdivided into careful smaller topics. There's a presentation of all six or thirteen mitzvot within those topics. Each one is connected to the Torah Shabbatav, be it at the level of the pasuk, be it at the level of showing where it fits into Tanakh, and um, it can give an overview and a, and a, and an understanding of the overall system that then would make a a proper and and targeted explanation of of Talmud and, and Machlokot, meaningful and and contextualized. No one's talking about getting rid of Talmud. One's talking about giving it a preliminary overview and of the of the subject, which would allow a delving into details to really have meaning and power. Well, very well said. Very well said. Very well said. So you mentioned the the Hanukkah um, issue and it just reminded me of what was so attractive about Hellenism to Jewish people at the time uh, that they didn't they saw that you can achieve such wisdom and brilliance from these great philosophers like Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, and you don't need you don't they didn't feel like they necessarily needed to 
go through the Torah route, which is more you know, more of a struggle. So the the secular Jew today, who is as I call post-religious, they feel like maybe they're too smart for religion. They're they kind of they see like, oh wow, there's all this wisdom out there, and I don't need to break my head over this kind of watered down pseudo mystical you know jargon that that people call Judaism. I could find it, you know, in mathematics and in other places. So I'm wondering if you have anything to, to add to that. Well, first of all, um, in the in, when when the Torah is uh, is being understood properly, um, all the sciences are part of the Torah. Uh, the Rambam uh, shows how, uh, um, both in practical terms, uh, mathematics is is fundamental to the halachot of Kiddush Hakodesh, astronomy, uh, but much beyond that, namely that uh, uh, the um, Hashem is known through his creation and through the scientific understanding of his creation. And he goes into very great detail about that uh, in the Mishneh Torah, uh, where he mentions that uh, the uh, secrets of the Torah, uh, the Devar Gadol, a component part of Maaseh Breshit, is understands the, the creation scientifically. And uh, therefore, he gives a summary of the science as he knew it in his day uh, to uh, incorporate that into the Mishneh Torah. And uh, the uh, the Torah, therefore, as it's being presented, but if it were following in the way of the Rambam, would would offer a exciting and important understanding of sciences as well as as a component part of of what it is. And uh, it's precisely because we are moving away from the way the Torah is supposed to be presented that it looks like, and uh, we are some sort of. Uh, New Age uh, movement, when in reality we are a completely scientific uh, chokhmah-based uh, movement and, uh, and contain everything that the wise men uh, of Greece uh, would be talking about, either because we've thought of it ourselves or because we were happy to incorporate whatever they have to offer uh, into our Torah, because that also shows us the way to understand how Hashem made his world. The um, I, uh, I find it very intriguing, uh, the introduction of Rabbi Rabinovich to the Morenabuchim and he comments directly on what you're talking about, that uh, we are, we're doing a tremendous disservice to the young people of our generation, not exposing them to the rationalistic teachings of the Rambam and the Moran of Uchim, and instead uh, focusing on these sort of uh, pseudo-mystical uh, uh, doctrines uh, because they're easier, because they, uh, they help people think and focus upon themselves rather than having to think about uh, Hashem's world. And uh, we're doing a tremendous service to uh, to our young people by doing that. Yeah, I think what the danger of that is that it's sometimes there are abstract ideas that seem so lofty, but in reality, they don't make a lot of sense. And they pull you away from the, the you know, purpose of a certain mitzvah or idea. And you kind of come to opposite conclusions sometimes. And I think it, it waters it down a lot. Um, and it, it just... it. Maybe maybe it's unfair to just criticize, you know, one mode of thinking. I don't want to say that all of them are like that, but there's definitely an issue that I find that people come out kind of confused, um, and there it's not it's not rigorous, and th that's really the unfalsifiable arguments. Un unfalsifiable. That's what arguments. they are. And when you train people in unfalsifiable arguments, it's it's just it's a road to nowhere because right. they're not trained how to think properly from the very beginning. You're trained to think with these type of arguments that are just, you know, imaginative and don't hold any real weight or any anything real. And it can just and and you can't prove it wrong and you can't prove it right. It's just, you right. know, and it just, that just becomes the way you associate and approach everything to do with Torah. That that's yeah. really what happens. That's true. And, so, uh, yeah, go but, ahead. Uh, isn't that? A, where is one to learn that rigorous thinking? If if uh, it's a direct consequence, if one's uh, if one sees one's learning as being this struggle to translate, if one sees one's learning as as you said, uh, Ben, uh, going down a rabbit hole leading nowhere, mm -hmm. where is that rigorous thinking uh, going to be coming from? Okay. So it's a direct consequence of not uh, of not following the Rambam's approach. If uh, the the Torah is not presented rigorously, systematically, there's a totality of 613 mitzvot, 
this is what they're about, this is what they lead to, this is step one, this is step two, this is step three, that opens the door to the imagination to get satisfaction from uh, elsewhere. Absolutely. And before we get to the next question, for those who are listening um, the and don't know this, the Rambam was the first to codify halakha, um, organize it um, like, like the rabbi is explaining, um, and really any before that everything was kind of uh, you go to your local rabbi and figure things out whereas the Rambam gave a book to people in simple Hebrew that people today can even understand and you know try to make it as clear as possible and then unfortunately you know he didn't intend for everybody to make commentary upon commentary upon commentary and water it down but that's unfortunately what happened so this leads us to our next question uh, in what way does Talmud Torah today diverge from the way Torah was first taught by Moshe at Sinai. So the Rambam describes in the introduction to the uh, parish of Mishnayot that uh, the Torah was given uh, in a very, very specific way. Uh, was all the 613 mitzvot were given one by one, first to Moshe Rabbeinu, and then he gave them over to Aaron, and then there was a procedure by we gave them over to various levels of uh, Chachamim until he gave them over to all of Israel. And each mitzvah was given uh, as its pasuk. He gives, he gives the example of basukot teshvu shivat yamim, and sukot you shall dwell for seven days. So that mitzvah was given. And then the, all the halachot relevant to that mitzvah were developed logically out of it. What uh, how, what, type, what makes a sukkah? What type of schach can you use? Well, is it a mitzvah for men or only or for women too? And there is a, a rigorous methodical explanation of each mitzvah and then they went through them and every halacha and then the people would gradually develop that understand that ask questions about it and then there would be another mitzvah and another mitzvah and they would experience it and they would implement it and they would uh, find what how it helped in their life and uh until they reached the 613 mitzvot and then uh, in dvarim it talks about how much before his life uh, asked the people uh, he, he, he reviewed it all to make sure that everybody had a comprehensive understanding of all 613 mitzvot. If they made a question, they could ask it. And uh, therefore, whether one was talking about a great uh, chacham or one was talking about a, uh, a small, uh, relatively ordinary person, they all had a grasp of all 613 mitzvot and how they fit together and how they made a life and uh, and what was good about that life and how it was founded on Yisadeh Torah. Nowadays, as we've said earlier, we've lost that, uh, we've, we've, we've forgo that uh, that bar. We've lowered the bar. People don't even think about the fact that uh, the Torah is comprised of 613 mitzvot and we're supposed to be knowing all of them. And uh, instead, we, we take it as a given that uh, children should come into uh, into school, start learning Gemarat, and we never ask ourselves, is this leading to the goal? Are we successfully giving over an understanding of the 613 mitzvot when it's all said and done? And I think if we, by any measure, we, there isn't, it, we are not, except in extraordinarily unusual uh, cases. The vast, vast majority of even Chachamin do not ever, through their learning, reach an understanding of even what the 613 mitzvot are, let alone a comprehensive understanding of all the mitzvot and all of their halakhot. And uh, this is a situation which uh, is uh, extremely, uh, extremely dangerous because it's the root cause of uh, all the problems that we're going to be having in our community. Hmm. I think another issue that people have a misunderstanding with is that, especially the way we're talking to Shiva, there's like a, there's this Das Torah mentality that, you know, all of the mitzvot were given at Sinai, everything and all of all of the avot kept the Torah and they're misunderstanding these, these midrashim and they're also seeing that, they're, they're, they think that like literally every mitzvah that we do today was given at Sinai and not understanding that just the, the foundations or the, the templates of, of the mitzvot um, were given over there. So can you kind of expand on that idea? Well, it's, it's a, uh, it's a fundamental of our, uh, of our belief that uh, the Torah comes from Moshe. Moshe is the source of the Torah. And, uh, and therefore the mitzvah system is synonymous with Moshe Rabbeinu uh, the, uh, and requires the uh, nivuah of Moshe Rabbeinu uh, to really exist. 
as mitzvot. And that was a unique feature of Moshe Rabbeinu. So what do the Chazal mean when they say that uh, uh, various things, uh, Avraham uh, was meeting the Malachim and uh, it was Pesach time or whatever it might be. So the, the Avot kept the mitzvot. What they're pointing to is, is that the mitzvot have a tremendous uh, logic to them and a tremendous benefit to them. And a uh, very large amount of uh, what the mitzvot are about uh, can be the purpose of those mitzvot. A, a philosopher with a, with, a, with a tremendous mind could discover on his own. So that is what uh, the Torah, what the Midrashim are trying to point to. They're trying to bring out the logic and wisdom and, and beauty of the mitzvot that a person with a mind like Avraham Avinu would be able to, uh, from his own philosophical understanding, come to much of the uh, same purposes and uh, general themes that the mitzvot uh, would be talking about. They're not just rules, arbitrary rules. They are they are life itself. And therefore, since they are life itself, a great mind can discover much of them. But uh, not that they can somehow replace uh, Moshe Rabbeinu and the Torah that he uniquely was able to get uh, through his unique nouveau uh, from Hashem. Mm. Very nice. Um, what core problems with Torah, Torah study did Rambam identify with our new approach? And what do these problems look like in our community's Talmud Torah study today? So in, in the introduction to the Mishnah Torah and also in the introduction to the Sefer HaMitzvot, uh, the Rambam uh, describes, and also in the introduction to the Ma'amar Triyat Metim, uh, the Rambam identifies as, uh, some fundamental problems uh, with uh, with education. Um, first and foremost, that uh, there's a traditionalism, namely that uh, when the Talmud was uh, was uh, was uh, was uh, put together, uh, Jews lived in Bavel. Aramaic was uh, the net was what people spoke. Like we speak English, they spoke Aramaic. What's more, there was a tremendous uh, there was a tremendous experience of mitzvot. Uh, they didn't uh, have a half a day of uh, day school, and uh, which uh, half a day they spent on uh, on uh, secular studies and half, or I should say, uh, sciences and and other and not and non Torah studies, but important studies nonetheless. And half a day on Torah, they studied all Torah all day long when they were children, and when they got older. And of course, the community was much more. Uh, uh, immersed in Torah, so Torah was and mitzvot was something which you woke, you learned, you you grew up, and you you knew a tremendous amount. We know much, much, much less. So therefore, the Talmud, when a person learned Talmud, uh, the Gemara in those days, there was a tremendous amount of background and language understanding that was simply a cultural given. But as time went on, uh, and uh, the uh, knowledge base of the Jewish people became weaker and weaker. That which previously had been uh, easily to understand for everybody ceased to be so. A, because uh, the language was difficult. B, the material wasn't familiar. C, the, the general level of understanding of the Jewish community had gone down. D, probably to a certain extent, people became used to a study of a, certain, of a different kind, which they learned, which they saw in other subjects. So uh, there had to be an acknowledgement of that and a uh, realization that just because things had been done a certain way in the past does not mean they have to be done that all for forever and ever that way. And the Rambam wrote his uh, Mishneh Torah in order to solve that problem. Now, uh, what the Mishneh Torah has to offer is, as we'd mentioned, an introduction to Yisudia Torah, foundations of the Torah given in the beginning, the, an organization of all the topics, a presentation of all the 613 mitzvot, with their psukim and explanations, and many, many, many times, a, a explanation of how the different mitzvot uh, fit together, and how the uh, how the uh, purpose of this mitzvot, mitzvot is implemented uh, in the mitzvot. Let me give one example. In the beginning of the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam talks in Hilchot Diyot about halach the that one uh, one must walk imitate uh, the ways of the Kodesh Bara. Mm -hmm. Chief among those. Uh, very high among those. It's Staka being a person who is uh, concerned about justice and of equality of justice and making sure that every human being uh, gets what he needs to be healthy and happy and be as close as he can to being ready to uh, think and learn about the Kaddish Baruch. Very, very far away in uh, Sefer Kinyan, it discusses about slaves. 
What can you do? What can you cannot do? And towards the end of Hilchot uh, Avadim, it talks about uh, the prohibition to uh, to uh, make a, a slave do a Buddha parach, what was done to us uh, in Egypt. Namely, work which has no purpose is designed just simply to humiliate the slave, either for the uh, sadistic desire of the owner, or he has something against the slave, or for whatever reason, the person would do it. Now, a Buddha's parach is allowed for uh, an Ebed Kanani, for a non-Jewish slave. It's allowed, and the Rambam points out, it's allowed. However, he says, and then he gets into a very long discussion, the person who is a wise person, the person who is Halech uh, B'derech HaChamim, will not treat his uh, slave in that way, even though it's permitted. But rather, he will uh, he will treat him well. He'll treat him kindly. He'll give every food that he has. He will give him. What do we see here? A carrying through and an implementation of Hilchot at the very beginning of the of the uh, book, showing how it applies in this particular even of Abadi and uh, and the Rambam. And in that way, he not only gives the totality of the mitzvot, he shows how they all fit together and how. A, a broad theme like imitating the Kaddish Baruch Hu can be seen expressed and in, in working its way through and modifying the, even the the how one treats an Ebed Kanan. Oh, nice. Very nice. Okay, so what changes in the way we do Talmud Torah today would Rambam advise? If the, if the Rambam would advise us today, how would you picture us learning Torah? How would you picture the Rambam would be telling us to be learning Torah? Well, I, I think that uh, what the Rambam says to do in, in, his, in his introduction to the uh, Mishneh Torah, uh, he would say to do today, because all he was he was way way ahead of his time. All the factors that he was talking about in his day have only metastasized like a cancer today. If if the understanding, if the knowledge base of the Jewish people at that time was lower than at the time of the Gemara, it is vastly lower today. If the amount of time that uh, was spent on learning to run the Rambam's time is less than it was done before, today it is vastly less. If um, uh, if, if the experience of other uh, chokhmot of other disciplines was uh, showing a, a need for a logical order in, in the Rambam's day, it is even more so today. So he would recommend that at the core of our curriculum, we put two things. As he says, if, if, uh, if one uh, takes his book, all one will need is in one hand the Tanakh and in the other hand in his book. And from that one, we'll be able to get a comprehensive understanding of all the Torah Shabbat That does not mean, incidentally, that he did not think that, that the Gemara had anything to offer as I'll explain in a second. But at the core of our curriculum should be an understanding of the Chumash, a, a focus on showing the students how the, where are the 613 mitzvot in the Chumash? That should be a goal, identifying them. Number two, and then on the other hand, an immersion in the Rambam from the beginning to the end, so that a student is familiarized with the Yisodei Torah and has a comprehensive understanding of the Taryag Mitzvot, the 613 Mitzvot, and connects them to his study in Chumash and in, uh, in Nevi'im, so that these things become a, a connected whole. And the Rambam shows how to do that in, in, in many, many, many times. He, he shows, he, he brings the, the psukim which are relevant, be it from Chumash, be it from Nevi'im, and shows how they fit into uh, the teaching of the Mitzvot. When the student, if we were to do that, just as a student is able to get an a, a understanding of sciences as difficult as math and uh, physics and chemistry, the Rambam offers a path to have a textbook where by high, end of high school, if we had focused on it, a student could have a comprehensive understanding of the 613 mitzvot, just like he has a, a, a high school level comprehensive understanding of physics or mathematics. But... Uh, we, it, it's going to require a uh, letting go of uh, of traditionalism. And again, the, uh, I, there's a pamphlet. I'll have to send you a link for that pamphlet by Ravar Lichtenstein. He discusses this in great uh, detail. And he says, we, we, he, we, he personally found it very, very difficult to, uh, to accept 
the words of the Rambam, but simply his experience in the field of seeing what's happening with high school students in Israel has forced him to acknowledge that the Rambam is correct and must be made the uh, bedrock, must substitute for, for Gemara as the, as the foundational uh, basis of study of mitzvot in the high schools. And he says, we have no right to be breaking our heads in the wall, clinging to a traditional ways of education on the backs of the Talmudim who are not getting an understanding of the Torah, which makes them want to have a lifelong connection to learning and growing and applying that learning and growing uh, to their lives. Yeah, and this tradition is not that even that old that they that everyone's afraid of breaking. Um, I think the American system, for example, how we learn, like we mentioned earlier, um, it, it seems like we've we've had enough of a sample size to know that it's not effective. And we have, you know, I think majority of yeshiva students who, let's say, go to modern Orthodox yeshiva are not speaking Hebrew and can't pick up a chumash and read it on their own um, when by the time they graduate high school. And, you know, and we everyone knows how expensive yeshiva is. So, like, we're not getting the bang for our buck. So what what is it that we can do today? Um, to maybe start like maybe a, a movement to kind of get back to the fundamentals? Well, uh, the um, in Israel, there's there's nice uh, beginnings of this. Yeah. And uh, uh, the I mentioned it before, the uh, Mishneh Torah, uh, in, in the uh, religious Zionist schools in Israel, there's a, there's a movement. It's not yet the center of their learning, but it's an aspect of the learning to learn through all 14 books of the uh, of the Mishneh Torah uh, during their uh, their their schooling career. So the beginnings of uh, of study of how to do that are opening up, and for adults also. Uh, today we think, let's say the the uh, most involved learners in a shul typically are the Dafyomi learners, but if we uh, consider what really is arising from that in terms of learning the 613 mitzvot. How much is really remembered if they even if they've gone there's their a seven year cycle or whatever it is and gone through all of Talmud? How much real understanding of mitzvot has emerged from that? I would suspect uh, very 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 little. The uh, the uh, if however that, w- that we moved towards a uh, a Rambam Yomi, that could be something that could really uh, that could really develop. So it, the the first step would be in making a top priority of uh, teaching Chumash clearly. And if uh, and if it has to be in translation, so it has to be. But uh, there should be, when one isn't succeeding right now in teaching anything. They're not learning how to read and translate that well, and they're not learning to understand the Chumash that well. So too with the Rambam. So with whatever combination of learning and translation, the Rambam has a letter to one of his students called Ibn Gabir. And he says, I, I don't know what to do. I, 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 can't, uh, I can't learn. So he says, uh, learning is is about ideas so if you have to read it in a translation fine but he did promise him if you spend the time on the Mishnah Torah since the Hebrew is English, is, is relatively easy you will learn how to uh, get Hebrew from that but even if you don't succeed Torah is fundamentally about ideas we should if, if we should not sacrifice teaching the ideas of Torah on the altar of uh, of language so what, that's up to the individual educator so whether it be a translate, some combina- what combination of learning uh, in in Ivrit, the Chumash, and Ivrit, the Mishneh Torah, that's up to the individual educator and his individual circumstance. But a student starting in the youngest grades should be learning Chumash, a fundamental part of his of his day. He should be identifying mitzvot, fundamental part of his day. He should be learning Rambam uh, from beginning to end as a fundamental part of his day. And then uh, the, uh, when the, 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 the aim should be that that should then carry through their lives. The, the, the interest in understanding how the mitzvot work, how they build a life, how they build a better life, that uh, would cause a person to want to continue that throughout his life and, and have a chumash yomi and a rambam yomi. And that person who cycles through the chumash and cycles through the rambam many times in their lifetime with this goal in mind, and with the proper educational support, we'll actually get some results. Yeah, I also think that um, there's a problem with the way Midrash, and especially Agadah, is taught as like 
hyper literal sometimes mm. um, that actually is counterintuitive but that's not the way it was meant to be learned and we see all the Geonim and Rambam they all say the same thing Avram Ben Rambam um, but I actually think that it's important to stress which which commentaries people should be studying on the on the Tanakh obviously the Chumash and, and the Tanakh uh, have some different commentators but I, I, I want to ask you, what do you feel is, if somebody who's starting out, because, for example, Ibn Ezra is very difficult. You can't start as a kid exactly. with Ibn Ezra. Exactly. It's not going to happen. So you, what, what, what does a child learn? Because right now it's Rashi, which is okay, you know, but again, you're learning, you're being taught that these are literal. Kind right. Of well, the... Um, the um, a tough question. <laughs> the, um, the, 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 the from this perspective, I mean, the, the student, the child is not going to know if his teacher doesn't know. So uh, if, um, if, a, uh, if a person uh, has not uh, learned the Yisadiyat Torah, the person who knows the Yisadiyat Torah looks at the Midrash, realizes that uh, it can't necessarily be literal. But, the, uh, a, a, but you're not going to cure everything in a day. So I would say that the best commentaries, if, if uh, just to get a person into the sugiya, into the area, would be something like, uh, I would say, Sforno. Sforno would be uh, an excellent uh, commentary. Uh, he's very, very brief. He's very, very solid. He deals with all of the issues you're talking about. He gives many examples of Midrashim and how to properly understand them. And his whole tenor is, is highly rational, and really gives you a sense of uh, how a rational mind is trying to read the Chumash. And uh, if you read his introductions, before every uh, Sefer of Chumash, he has an introduction, and he shows uh, the big picture of how, what's that what's that Sefer about, how does it fit in with the other Sefarim. So uh, I would say if one had to pick one Mepharesh and, uh, and build from there, who uh, I mean, there's other Mepharshim who are very excellent too, but he also has the uh, the beauty of being relatively simple, relatively short, doesn't require a tremendous amount of background information. Uh, excellent for a person who's a more advanced mind who's willing to put in some time developing uh, some background. The Ral Bag is an excellent uh, commentary as well. Okay. Difficult, difficult commentary, uh, and uh, you need to, you need to have a real strong grasp of the Yisodia to Rao the Rambam to. Uh, to realize where sometimes he moves away from that, but um, also tremendously rational mind and, and sh also deals with Midrashim in a very rational way. And again, gives a, a whole sense of what, what the reading of Torah is about. And he also has the excellence of uh, doing a lot of what we're talking about, of showing where the mitzvot fit into the uh, into the Torah. He, he, he doesn't always agree with the Rambam as to what the mitzvot are, but the general idea that one's a fundamental part of one's learning of Torah should be identifying the mitzvah and seeing where what the Torah is saying about the mitzvah. He does a very good job of uh, very very good job of that. Excellent choices, and also uh, I would say uh, perhaps Radak on on the Nach. I was talking just Chumash, but yes, Radak is a very very good. Unfortunately, I think the only Bereshit he wrote oh, only for Bereshit, right? He only wrote on Bereshit Radak. Who's that? In the Chumash, he only wrote. I think uh, I think maybe in Bereshit. Of course, uh, the Rambam's son, Rav Avram Ben Rambam, wrote a commentary. Also, I think only on Brishit and Shemot, but outstanding, outstanding uh, perush. Amazing. So, um, before we go, we want to ask you, you know, where we could find you, because you know, Rabbi Maruf, our rabbi, speaks very highly of you, and was like, you know, he's someone you should really try to interview. Uh, so, I'm glad we were able to make this happen. Uh, but I just want to add one thing because I, I mentioned earlier. Can I add one more yeah, point? Please, please, Absolutely, go on. of course. Uh, I, I mentioned before that by no means did the Rambam want to uh, exclude the Talmud. Again, I'm, and and by no means did uh, people I quote either say that. Rabbi Lichtenstein was by no means saying to exclude the Talmud. He was simply talking about the fact that uh, there's a certain basis and knowledge of certain overall picture that the ordinary person is not going to get from the Talmud. So the question is, so what? then are we going to get use the Gemara for? Where does Gemara fit into the picture? Mm. So I just want to give one example um, of a sort of, you mentioned there are many, many commentaries on the Rambam, uh, and many of them oftentimes are more confusing. They, the Rambam tries to simplify and they complicate. But uh, uh, what commentaries do I recommend on the Rambam? And that happens to also show uh, where where would Gemara fit into uh, into this curriculum. 
Uh, I'd like to give two examples. One, uh, which uh, outstanding commentary, is the Yad Pshuta of Rabbi uh, Nacham Rabinovich. Tremendous job. A, uh, showing the Yisudia Torah and how bringing them from the Mar Nebuchim, connecting uh, all the different parts of the Rambam, uh, be it Pirish Mishnayot, be it uh, be it the Mar Nebuchim, be it uh, letters, be it uh, Rabbah Rabbah Rambam, any Rambam you learn, he will he will bring up, he will give you all of that information. Tremendous job. Number two, he will connect you to the uh, to the Gemara. Uh, that, depending upon a person's level, is very very valuable. And oftentimes, a Rambam is very very difficult to understand without some information that is coming from the from the uh, Gemara. Uh, and so, what when what type of commentary does one really want for the Rambam? Uh, I think that the best, though Rab, uh, Nachum Rabbanomich's is very, very good, I think there's one which is even more outstanding and shows the way uh, of how this could work. What would be the commentary on the Rambam? And that would be the Harei Kedem of uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik. The Harei Kedem is, uh, is a commentary on the, on the holidays. And uh, he brings down Rambams. And I'll just give an example of the um, of the Rambam we were talking about about Hanukkah, the very first uh, Rambam at Hanukkah. gives a long historical explanation of what happened in the time of Hanukkah. So uh, the question is, so where is this all leading? It's very very difficult to know where this is leading. So Rabbi Soloveitchik brings down the Gemara that uh, at a time of uh, of a tzara, that Hallel is given at a time of a tzara that we are rescued from. Rambam doesn't say that. He brings that down. That one insight, he then connects to that first halacha. This history is there to show us that we are the obligating factor. What's obligating us in Hallel is that there was a crisis from which we were rescued. And so knowing that there, it's, it's not just a historical preamble, but that there's a halachic uh, purpose to that uh, preamble. It's the mechayev. It's the mechayev in Hallel. The Rambam doesn't say that. But uh, the right explanation will show that. Oftentimes, and he doesn't go into a long, long uh, pilpul. He just shows the Gemara, which illuminates the concept of that Rambam. Excellent work. He does that again and again and again. And that's what I would love to see on a Rambam, namely a selection of Gemarot, which allow the Rambam to do what the Rambam does, give the, the basic understanding, share the connections, and bring down Gemarat from, there are many people who are able to do Gemarat. They should share their vast knowledge, like Rabbi Soloveitchik did, in the Rambam, so that a person can see very, very precisely which, what problem in the Rambam, what lack of information, what lack of principle in the Rambam is that, uh, is that Gemara uh, solving, illuminating. Yeah. And that, if done in a simple, clear, and logical way, I think is the way to the future. The people who can do Gemara, producing commentaries like uh, like Hari Kedem, Rav Shurkin, who, who who distilled that, I think is pointing the way to what would be a proper a commentary on the Rambam. You know, I have a confession. I bought the Hari Kedem many, many years ago. I never opened it up once. I'm being uh, totally honest. I hope if, if all I do is, uh, is, is encourage you to do so, I think <laughs> that, uh, I, I, and uh, every Yom Tov, I uh, try to go through the Hare Kedem on that Yom Tov, and I'm trying to, to the best of my ability, connect that to make a little, the type of uh, commentary the Rambam I'm talking about myself personally. Uh, sometimes I agree with what Rabbi Soloveitchik is saying, sometimes I go in a little bit of a different direction, just like he does with Rav Chaim Soloveitchik. But whichever way you go, He's he is amazing in uh, in in giving insight and uh, opening up the door to tremendous sorts of uh, of uh, possibilities. You know, when Rabbi Maruf, our Rabbi, when he moved to Israel before he left, he handed me uh, one of the shiure sort of Soloveitchik, and he said to me, "He's like, learn." It was something on Havdalah. He's like, "Go through this before I leave," and he's like, "You're going to see like the genius of Rav Soloveitchik." Unbelievable. And like, it was like surprising to me because Reverend Ruth never really talks like, you know, like he doesn't really talk about Soloveitchik. Like when, you know, when, we, when, when it just didn't really come up ever. So I was like, really? Mm -hmm. Like, like that's what you're like, you know, single, singling out for me. And he's like, yeah, right. 
<laughs> it's, it's incredible. Another thing I wanted to ask about, do you suggest that people should learn the Parish of Mishnayot of the Rambam? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that is, in fact, I know that Rav Kafich, not I know, but um, Rav, Rav Kafich's um, Mishnah Torah, a lot of what he spends time doing is showing how all the Nosei Kalim and all the commentaries on the Rambam, all their Pilpulim and all their Kashas and all their questions are all because they never learned Parish of Mishnah Torah. It's, the, it's every true. single time, the way he just simply added it all out, he's like, right. Parish of Mishnah Torah. Yeah, there's a lot to be gained. I mean, it's, it's little, there's some complexity there because uh, the Rambam oftentimes changed his mind. Yeah. So uh, one has to be careful with that because uh, the Rambam, uh, we still have uh, original works of the Rambam's uh, Mishnah, of his uh, Mishnah Torah. There's they're crossed out. There's so many things crossed out and, and scribbled on top. The new uh, the new thinking. I believe that Rav Kafich though brings in the in the footnotes every time there was an uh, the, 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 the he Rav does he does a magnificent yeah. job of showing all the different gear so Correct. But, so you, uh, you're aware of it as you go through it, right? Yes, it's yes. He, that's a tremendous yeah. thing he does. But not necessarily did the Rambam uh, update. I mean, he had a tremendous amount of works. Not always did he update the Parish Mishnah to these latest thinking in the Mishneh Torah. Uh, so, though it's an extremely valuable tool and, uh, and 100% recommended, I would actually, though, recommend uh, more Rav, uh, Yad Pshuta, Rav Nachum Rabinovich's work uh, over Rav Kafech. It's, it's simpler. It's yeah, more yeah. Dramatic. Rav Kafech is more lumbus. It's, it's different. Yes, and, yeah, yeah. and he brings down, he'll bring down every relevant parish Mishnayot. It's unbelievable. So where that, you will not have to worry about it, that you're, there's going to be a parish Mishnayot that is relevant to that Rambam. He's not going to bring down. He will bring it down. He'll bring he'll it down bring anyway. It. I he'll bring down the the Rambam's son, the Tshuva, if it's relevant. He, tremendous, his, the, his presentation of sources, I think, is second to, uh, to none. Amazing. Thank we you so thank much. You so and, much. And before we go, we want to know if you have anything to plug. Maybe some somewhere people can find you, your shiurim. Um, I um, I I don't really have a a public uh, presentation of that type. I, I work with a small groups of people, but uh, I'll give you my email. I have, uh, as I was saying, I, every Yom Tov, I uh, I prepare thirty days for the Chag, and I I, I try my best to, uh, in my own small way start building uh, what I think the uh, the parish of the Rambam should look like. I share that with those people that are interested. So I'd be glad, to, anybody who's interested, I'd be glad to join them to the mailing list. Uh, also, I give uh, be on away. Zoom. So if anybody wanted to join those, uh, they're welcome to do so as well. I'll, I'll give you all the information. Thank you so Perfect. much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Chazak Baruch. Chazakhan, all your endeavors. Thank you. It's a, It was a pleasure meeting you and uh, and uh, I can only say that uh, Rabbi Maruf has done a very good job. Ah, thank you. May there be many more Talmudim like yourself. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Amen. Amen.